What are the qualities essential to meditation? In fact, essential to the whole practice is alertness. The texts define it as being aware of what you're doing. This is where the meditation ties in with the teaching on karma. That while you're meditating, you have to be really, really alert, conscious of your input into what you're doing. It's what makes it a skill, but also provides the basis for the insights we're trying to gain. Seeing how much we really do shape what we're doing right now, and getting a sense of the intentions behind that, the skill with which we're doing it. And also the pervasiveness of this constant shaping that's going on all the time. It's a part of our awareness that we tend to block out. We're more focused on things outside. This person did that, that person did this, and many times we forget what we did to cause that person to do what he or she did. Or we look at what's happening in our meditation and we so it's either a bad day for the meditation, my mind's not in the right mood. We don't see what we're doing right now that could possibly change that bad meditation. So try to develop this quality. Be alert to what you're doing. When you're focusing on the breath, be alert not only to the breath, but also to the act of focusing. This is what enables you to develop a sense of skill with the meditation. Sometimes you reflect after the fact as to what you did. Other times you try to notice what you're doing while you're doing it, so you see the immediate cause and effect relationship. And part of your alertness is to see when it's proper to do that kind of analysis and when to put it aside. Sometimes you get into good states of concentration. And you don't want to analyze it too much. If you start analyzing it, you destroy the concentration. So in cases like that, you wait till later. Particularly when you find yourself in a state of concentration and you're still fresh to it, you're still new to it. And John Fuhrman gives the example, gives the analogy of pouring concrete. If the concrete hasn't yet set, you don't want to take away the forms. In other words, when it's going well, you don't dare do anything different, even to step back to analyze it, until it's really solidified. And when that state of mind is solidified, then you can step back. And if you find stepping back destroys it, then don't step back. Stay with that state. And even as you're staying with that state, there'll be a little part of the mind that notices the fact this is, this is the time not to analyze. So you stay immersed in that state of concentration. When it solidifies and you get more used to it, get more sensitive to what's going on, then you can begin to analyze, step back a little bit to see what you're doing. How did you get the mind there? What are you doing in the present moment that's keeping it there? And it's in seeing that present input that a lot of the insight lies. Because many times you can see the drawbacks, say, of a particular sensual pleasure. Or you can see the drawbacks, the, the suffering or the unsatisfactory nature of a lot of life in general. But if you don't see your input into it, it's, that insight is not enough to free you. Because after all, lots of people have been talking about how miserable the world is since way before the Buddha. And if it's just complaining, then it goes nowhere. That's, that's the kind of attitude that is rightly labeled as pessimism. Things are bad and there's just no way out. But the Buddha came along and found that, well, the reason things are bad is because of what you're doing. And you can change what you do. There is that alternative. There is that escape. So that was the nature of his insight, to see what he was doing in the present moment. And that night of his awakening, they gained the three knowledges, knowledge of past lives, knowledge of the 
passing away and re-arising of beings. And then finally, knowledge of the ending of what they call the mental effluence or the mental fermentations. These things that come oozing out of the mind and keep it bound to constant wandering on. That second insight was insight into the nature of karma, the role that action plays in shaping people's lives. And in the third insight, what the Buddha did was turn around and look at the karma he was doing right then and there. What he was doing that was causing suffering, causing stress. And also seeing what he could do to stop doing that, to abandon the cause of that stress, which was the craving and the ignorance. So had that quality of alertness that he developed in the path was what enabled the insight to happen. And John Lee has an interesting passage where he talks about mindfulness and alertness, lying at the essence of meditation practice and how when you finally reach insight, mindfulness turns into jnana or knowledge, and alertness turns into direct seeing. You directly see what you're doing to cause suffering. And you develop the knowledge that shows you how to stop doing that. That knowledge comes from your mindfulness. So these simple qualities that we're working on here, mindfulness, keeping something in mind, and alertness, keeping watch for what we're doing. These are the things that, as they get strengthened, are enable us to gain insight. The mindfulness is what gives us some sense of what alternatives there are. If we don't see there's any alternative to what we're doing, we just keep on doing the same old thing. But mindfulness reminds us there is something else. And many times in the text the Buddha talks about how people's normal escape from the drudgery or the unsatisfactory nature of their lives is to look for sensual pleasure because they think that's the only out. Mindfulness is what reminds us there is another out. We may dwell on the, how much we like our sensual pleasures and we dwell on how much we dislike pain. And it's that act of dwelling on these things that keeps us, keeps us tied down. The pleasure and the pains don't tie us down. It's the way we react to them. That's what ties us down. The way we react to them and the way we keep creating them. So part of the practice, as the Buddha pointed out, is to get the mind into states of concentration. Develop a sense of pleasure that doesn't have to have that dwelling and that obsession. In other words, the Buddha says there is an alternative to pain, and it's not sensual pleasure, it's the pleasure of the jhanas, pleasure of concentration. In other words, you, you look for another out, you look for another alternative. Keep that in mind, the fact that these alternatives are there. And then as you develop that Alternative, then you keep in mind the fact that there's, there's a deathless, something that lies outside of this. Without that, you're afraid to let go of your jhanas. This was the problem of the teachers that the Buddha studied with before his awakening. They didn't think there could be any alternative. If you left that state of jhana, you just go back to your ordinary sensual pleasures and pains, and they didn't want to do that. So they're afraid to let go. But the Buddha reasoned there must be an alternative, which is why he was willing to let things go. He was willing to experiment, to see what the other alternatives were. Unfortunately, we have his example. So as you get the mind into a really good state, you don't have to be afraid that by letting go you necessarily will have to go back to ordinary levels of awareness, ordinary levels of pleasure and pain. If the mind is really solid, really mindful, really aware, really alert, 
to see what it's doing. It begins to see that there are other alternatives. So mindful and alert alertness are very basic qualities in the mind. Simply keeping something in mind and watching what you're doing. And these are things that we were taught by our parents way back. Simply the Buddha shows that if you're really, really mindful, really alert, these qualities, when they're thoroughly developed, can lead to another sort of happiness, another sort of well-being altogether. And it's because of the nature of action, the nature of experience, that they do this. If, if our experiences were not shaped by our actions, there'd be no need for alertness. Or alertness couldn't do anything for us. But the fact that being alert to what you're doing does make a difference. It depends on the fact that what you're doing makes a difference. If you were to ask what the Buddha's most basic teaching was, it's the teaching on karma. And everyone agrees that it's basic. Most people think of it in the sense of elementary, that you go beyond that. But it's, actually it's basic in the sense it permeates everything. His understanding of action, how action shapes our experiences, how action can be mastered so it takes us beyond our ordinary wandering on and opens us up to the deathless. It is a basic teaching, but it's not simply elementary. It's pervasive. It provides the context for everything else. So always keep that context in mind. You can see the unsatisfactory nature. You can see that things are in constant stressful and not self. But unless you see what your participation is doing to make things in constant stressful and not self, The insight just simply can't chip away at your ordinary attachments. There will always be that sense inside, well, if something better came along, I'd be happier. But when you realize it's because you have to change your habits, that's what will make you happier. That's where real work can be done. And it's right here that the work has to be done, has to be focused.